the cowpock or the wonderful effects of the new inoculation. This is a cartoon by 18th century satirical artist James Gilray, and it depicts the rumours being spread by, by people who are opposed to the practice of this, this inoculation. And here you can see these bovine-like appendages springing out of people, which was, um, which was the idea that they'd been given this preparation of cowpox, which was a much milder disease than the dreaded smallpox. And since the first attempts to vaccinate against smallpox, the 18th century people have held concerns about the safety of vaccines. Would injecting people with cowpox cause strange things to happen? And today we face similar challenges, where ideas almost as wild as this cartoon are actually exploding. Did Bill Gates invent the coronavirus pandemic so he could put microchips into the vaccines? And then could these be activated by 5G? <laughs> the COVID pandemic is not only a, a pandemic of a virus, but it is also a fantastic misinfodemic with extraordinary ideas spreading faster and further than the truth. And while no other public health intervention have saved more lives than clean water antibiotics and vaccines, Vaccines have always come with some level of social disruption. So this talk is about how the explosion and distortion of truth, and particularly around vaccine safety, is challenging us in our efforts to control diseases and can thwart potentially our efforts to deploy our emerging COVID-19 vaccines. Now, no vaccine is 100% safe or 100% effective, but some come pretty close. The safety of inoculation and vaccination are relative. On the left is a drawing that shows a typical reaction to the ancient practice of smallpox variolation. Nasty, fatal in about 1%, and, but very much preferable to actually acquiring the disease naturally. And on the right is a drawing of a typical reaction to vaccination against smallpox, still pretty big. By the end of the 20th century, smallpox vaccination carried a death rate of around 1%, um, or about 1 million people died who received the vaccine, but serious events were actually quite common. And it may seem strange that people would take a procedure that carried such a high risk of death or a nasty reaction, but when faced with the, the disease that killed around 30% of its victims, it was a perfectly rational decision. When the threat of smallpox became a distant memory, the, risk was, the risks associated with vaccination became a greater focus for people. And so began the vaccine confidence life cycle. This is a diagram that many of us in the business call the famous Chen diagram. It's based on a drawing published in 1994 by American doctor, Dr. Bob Chen. And what it shows is that before a vaccine is available, when a disease is present and really scary, there's a high acceptance of the vaccine when it arrives, it's embraced, and the disease starts to go away. As the disease becomes less visible, people shift their focus to the potential safety of the vaccine, maybe about focusing on real or even just perceived safety effects, and the disease inevitably resurges. Reminded that the disease is actually really terrible, confidence in the program resumes and the disease becomes controlled. But let's think about these possible side effects. What is real and what is rumour? And how can we tell? Vaccine safety is assessed throughout the life of the product and sometimes beyond. It begins in the lab. After review and approval by the appropriate regulatory authorities tasked with protecting our health, the vaccine can progress to perhaps 30 or so uh, human volunteers in what we call a phase one trial. This is to test the dosing and the safety and to examine the immune response. All going well from here, a larger study called a phase two might progress and here there'll be a few hundred volunteers. The safety will be monitored closely and those early volunteers can be followed up for perhaps a year or more. And if all has gone well, then phase three studies might progress. And these can include tens of thousands of people. And some will get the vaccine and others will get a placebo or a dummy injection, which has no benefit. And by the end of these trials, we can compare the outcomes between the vaccinated and those who did not receive a vaccine. And providing the vaccine's been shown to be effective, 
and there are no risks, you know, increased risks for serious safety events, it might become, the vaccine might get approval by the regulatory authorities to be used. But the assessment of the vaccine does not end there. We can't yet rule out the potential for very rare events that may be caused by the vaccine. And this is where the next stage of assessment steps in, or what we call phase four. And that has thousands of millions to participants. Here is where we get into really big data. We need vast numbers of people. If a vaccine causes a serious adverse event in, say, one per 100,000 people, we need some pretty big data to show it. If the event occurs in, say, one per million people, then we need even bigger data to show it. So obviously we can't run clinical trials with millions of people in. So fortunately, there's a much more pragmatic way to do this. And let me give you an example of the power of big data. One common myth associated with vaccines is that they cause autism, particularly the MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. And this has been proven wrong over and over again during the past 20 years by big data. And a very nice example of the power of big data in assessing vaccine safety comes from Denmark. Investigators here tracked over 650,000 children who were born between 1999 and 2010. Most of them got vaccinated and around 32,000 did not. They found that around 6,500 were diagnosed with autism. And then the researchers found that there was no increased risk in autism among the kids who received the MMR vaccine and those who did not. Also, the study didn't find any increased risk for autism, even in subgroups of kids who, who had high risks, for example, that who, who had a sibling who had autism or scored high on an autism risk assessment test. There are many other studies, just like this one, addressing even just this one question. So big data can help us answer very big questions about vaccines. But today we're facing a new challenge, and I'm sure that most of you didn't have this one in their diary for 2020. In December 2019, a strange pneumonia was noticed in Wuhan, China. And soon after, the cause of this was identified as a new coronavirus. And sadly, the world were not prepared to prevent the spread of the virus. And while China managed to get it under control, other countries have not. And today, there have been over 32 million cases and almost 1 million deaths. And deaths in some places have outstripped the ability of the health system and the ability of the undertakers and the cemeteries to cope. The COVID world illustrates what the world looks like without just one vaccine. Major epidemics and pandemics are as old as civilization itself, and you can find mass graves everywhere. So to help get us out of this 21st century pickle, we need safe and effective vaccines urgently. How can we do this when normally it takes 10 to 15 years? And up until now, the fastest vaccine ever developed was the mumps vaccine. That was in 1967 and it took four years. So what can we do to meet this need? Well, this is not 1967. In fact, this is 2020 and it's an international emergency. Over the past few decades, we've developed technologies for vaccine development, whereby you don't even need the disease-causing organism, you only need its genetic code. And with the genetic code in hand, scientists can make a range of vaccine types. They can do this very, very fast. And the reason they can do this very fast is because they've now got some practice. Recent experience with Ebola vaccines, previous coronaviruses, and other emerging diseases means that there's some templates that are actually ready to go. You just plug in the instructions for the new virus and press play. The hardest part is actually testing them in people to make sure that they not only work, but are also very safe and without missing out any steps. Science and technology gave us the first COVID vaccine in humans, into a human, in less than 45 days. But these are just candidates at the moment. We don't know for sure if they work or how safe they are. How can we assess them super fast without skipping out any vital steps? And how can we squash a decade into a year? There are two things that make the seemingly impossible possible. And first is lots and lots of money. Vaccine development is very expensive and risky business. Most candidates will fail before they, before they get very far. And the more further down the track they get, the more money they cost, upwards of a billion dollars. 
And then add to that the cost of actually making the facility, building the facility to make millions and millions of doses. That's another billion dollars. So investors need to be very cautious, and often a single company is going this alone. However, for COVID, this risk has been spread among many, many inter entities across the globe. So in a nutshell, money is no object. The other thing is running the steps in parallel to each other. Instead of completing each step or phase before moving to the next one, activities are being overlapped with each other in concert as though millions of lives depended on it. And this has been done before in the recent effort to bring a vaccine, uh, a bowler vaccine to Africa. But once these trials have gathered enough data to show a vaccine works or doesn't, and, and, and they, know, you know, they know the safety profile or for, for a certain number of people, we still can't rule out possible rare safety events. So enter the next phase, enter big data. Today I have on my wrist more computing power than NASA had to send astronauts to the moon and bring them back safely. We have massive administrative data collections, we have artificial intelligence, we have smartphone apps, and we have social media, and we have statistical methods that most people couldn't even imagine 30 years ago. Imagine a study that can utilise the entire team of 5 million, where you can look at all the emergency room visits, you can look at all the admissions to hospital, and you can link these events to the vaccination exposure. And then you know which cases were vaccinated and which were not, and you can make comparisons about risk, just like they did in Denmark. And it, we can do this in almost real time. Today we have the technology and the expertise to detect harm from a vaccine that occurs so rarely, perhaps only one in a million people experience the harm, or even fewer. But despite the science of vaccine safety, the thing that worries people most about vaccines is safety. And hesitancy towards vaccines is growing. So what is vaccine hesitancy? Vaccine hesitancy refers to the delay in acceptance or the refusal of vaccines um, despite their availability or the services being available to people. Surveys from all over the world continually highlight that the main concerns people have centre around vaccine safety or the perceived risks of vaccines. The Vaccine Confidence Project tracks people's opinions about vaccines all over the world. And here we can see in 2015, uh, there were some populations that had at least 40% of people disagreeing that vaccines were safe. Are these fears based on science? No, they're based on something much more complicated. Vaccine hesitancy is complex and context specific, and it varies across time and place and across vaccines. It's influenced by factors such as complacency, convenience and confidence. Yet, you're actually more likely to be struck by lightning than experience a serious adverse event to, to a vaccine. The odds of being struck by lightning in the US are around 1 in 280,000. But addressing this problem is not easy, and the COVID-19 pandemic and the explosion of information, or the infodemic, is making it even harder. Part of the problem is that we're hardwired to take shortcuts when it comes to processing information. The tendency to accept information that confirms your beliefs is explained by confirmation bias. While the idea that Bill Gates invented the COVID pandemic or that COVID vaccines will be a form of mind control are likely to feel true for people who have conspirational beliefs, the idea that vaccines are full of dangerous chemicals is likely to feel true to people who have a fear of chemicals or chemophobia. Messages that make such claims can be amplified and this can be very, very fast and very effective at shifting people's opinions when the messages resonate with their underlying beliefs. It is much easier to believe something you read if you already want to believe it. There are many facts around the development of COVID vaccines that are becoming distorted or are misunderstood. And falsehood flies. Rumours are contributing to, to what is being now called an infodemic, an overabundance of information, some true, some not. And the facts have become lost or distorted, and sadly, lies travel faster and further. 
A study published in Science in 2018 followed 126,000 rumours that were spread by around 3 million people. And the false news reached people uh, faster than the truth and it diffused, it diffused further. Using Twitter data from 2006 to 2017, the investigators classified news as true or false using information from six independent fact checkers. And the false, falsehoods diffused faster, farther, deeper, and more broadly than the truth for all categories of information. The authors suggested that it was the novelty of false information such as fear and disgust and surprise that made it more shareable. And finally, bots shared truth uh, equally, truth and lies equally. It was the people that actually amplified the lies. So what does this mean for COVID vaccines? When Kiwis were asked if they'd get a COVID vaccine, 74% yet said yes, which is about the, uh, the, the global average. When people if, were asked why they would not take a vaccine, concerns about safety were the most cited, and this is consistent globally. So why are so many people concerned about the safety of a future COVID-19 vaccine? Perhaps we're just not doing a very good job of helping people to understand how vaccine safety might be assessed. But we also need to address something far more complex than simply providing better and more information. We need to foster trust and we need to inoculate against misinformation as well. Vaccine science has come a long way since the days of the smallpox inoculation. In just a few weeks uh, from posting the genetic code for this new pandemic pathogen, vaccines were ready for their human volunteers. In just nine months from the time China and the WHO raised the alarm, several vaccines are now in advanced clinical trials that will soon yield data about their efficacy and about their safety. But the vaccine journey doesn't stop there. And with preparation and collaboration, we can actually perform the largest vaccine safety studies ever undertaken. The COVID pandemic has brought with it an infodemic, an overabundance of information that has resulted in an unprecedented distortion of facts. No matter how safe a COVID-19 vaccine proves to be, we may face a challenge in convincing people about the data. And in all this, we all have a role to play from global agencies, scientific journals, mass media, social media platforms. And the one thing that everybody can do is to check before they share. Thank you.